Ready. Well, this morning I'm going to be preaching from Romans chapter 8. You can go ahead and turn there if you'd like. I'll get there in a few moments. But the title of my message this morning, uh, it comes from Romans chapter 8, and the title is God is for us. God is for us. And I think that's important to learn and to understand in the times that we're in today when it seems like doom and gloom. It seems like there's no good news on TV. And just to be reminded that God is for us is a wonderful thought. Now, I know many of you in your time of life have gone through a time where maybe you went to college and you had midterms and you had finals. And a lot of times we sweat those final exams, especially when the teacher all through the course keeps making reference, be prepared, the final is coming, you need to study, and you get this level of anxiety, and you know it's going to be a big test, and then he reminds you how much that final will calculate in your final grade, and and so You know, there's a lot of thought that goes in, and you realize you need to study. But Charles Stanley tells this story that when he was in seminary many years ago, uh, he had an evangelism professor, and he was stressing to them, yes, of preaching and, and, and teaching, but witnessing to others. But one of the lessons this evangelism director or professor wanted to get across to his students was God's grace, the grace of God. And so before the last or the last regular class, he gathered his students together and he said, now you know next week is your final and I want you to study. I want you to be prepared. You need to read this and this. And he, you know, he went over it. And, and, and so the students had the weekend to study and they studied. And then it came Monday morning and it came for the test. I heard that. I came time for the test, and he said, now remember this. When the test is handed to you, I want you to read all two pages of the test first before you do anything. And so he passed out the test. And even on the test, it said, read the first two pages before you do anything. And so they passed out, students started, and you could tell that many of them were reading the test, and you could hear groans, because some of them said, man, I didn't know he was going to cover this. And as they got to the second page, they were reading on and on and on, and and they saw how in-depth the test was. They saw all the questions, and you could tell their minds must have been swimming to think about how comprehensive this test was. And then it got to the end, and it said, you have a choice. You either can complete this exam as given or sign your name at the bottom and in doing so, receive an A for this assignment. Now, what would you do? Would you sign it? Preston said he'd sign it. Right, Preston? Quick. First one. Well, there were those that, you know, there were some who resented. Resent, like, I've studied all weekend. I came to take this test. And you mean if I sign it, I get an A? But what about all this hard work? They got mad and got up and just left and didn't sign it. Guess what they got? There were some that said, well, you know, I studied all week. I'm going to take this test. I'm not signing it. I'm going to take it. That one individual that took the test, he said, I did my best. Well, he got his grade, and it was a C plus. You think about that story. God is for us. Amen? And when God is for us, Who can be against us? God is for us. When God offers his grace, we need 
to be willing to accept that grace. And God brings his grace to us in such a way then we need to realize that no matter how hard we had studied, we would never make that A, but God gives us an opportunity or God gives us a way to have that grade and to also learn about God's grace. Now, I want you to look in Romans chapter 8, and I want you to look at verses 31 and 32. Here we find again, Paul reminding us here in Romans chapter 8, And here's what he said. He said, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? And so this morning, as we think about that story and how this professor was trying to show, and he knew his students had been studying, but he wanted to give them an example of God's grace. This morning, God is for you. Now, many of you have grown up in LaBelle, but some of you come from different areas and different parts of the United States, and I want you to think about your elementary school that you went to. Maybe you're thinking, you say, well, preacher, my elementary school is not there no more. But think of your elementary school. Let's say that 53 years after you graduated from elementary school, they asked you to come back and give a speech. And you're thinking, hmm, what am I going to say to these kids? What am I going to say to them graduating elementary school? Well, there was a man named Eugene Lang. He was asked to come back to his elementary school 53 years afterwards. His elementary school is known as East Harlem. His school had turned into a place where children were poor, where the dropout rate for that school was among some of the highest in the nation. Lang got up to speak to these young people that were sixth graders leaving this this elementary school, and, and he was sharing with them about the importance of working hard and studying and going to college, and he said, this is your first graduation, and you should have dreams about what you want to be, and as he was continuing, he looked out, and he could tell he did not have the audience. But then he started saying, I need, he said, you need to stay in school. And then all of a sudden, it even surprised him. He said, if you stay in school, I will provide a college scholarship for each one of you. Well, you can imagine then people's eyes opened up again and and people clapped. and, And of those 61 fidgety sixth graders, they all received a college education. But, but besides that, at that moment, Eugene Lang realized that if these kids were going to make it from this elementary school to middle school and into high school, that work needed to begin. And he hired tutors to work with these students after school. He gave them the best chance he could because he said, I am in this with you. I am for you. And do you know that in the time that Eugene Lang has done this, now some 12,000 students have attended college because someone says, I am here with you. Guys, I want you to know this morning, God is saying, I am for you. Now think about it. If God is for you in this world that seems like it's coming off its wheels, even in this time, you've got someone cheering on your side. You've got someone that's saying, hang in there. You've got someone that is there to help you and to continue on in life. I know some people look at the scripture there in, in verse 31 And it says, what then are we to say if God is for you? And I know people say, well, it's that if. Really, if you look at the Greek, it should say, since God is for 
you. Since God is for you. There's no if here. God is for you. And this morning, this morning, to realize that, last night in one of the games that I was watching and, and uh, a quarterback in one of the teams, he, let's just say he, he messed up. And this coach came over, and I mean this coach was in his ear. I mean just telling him, you know, where he had messed up. And then a few minutes later, this quarterback kind of made up for it. And that same coach was right there just excited and, and lifting him up. And then later they, they told on television that coach was his dad. <laughs> now, I don't know how that is, having a dad as a coach sometimes. I but can you imagine? Yeah, that dad was upset when he did something bad. But, man, that dad was, you know, in life sometimes we need dads. We need people that are cheering us on, that are there for us, running down the, the sidelines if it is, and, and to realize that, you know, we, we need that help. And yeah, sometimes we mess up, but we're there for you. You know, God is there. You know, I know sometimes today, you know, when you need service or, heaven forbid, you have to call CenturyLink or one of those others, um, you know, be ready right, Daryl? Wait time, foreign languages. But you know, when you call on God, there's no waiting. There's no probationary period. There's no small print that kicks you out. God is for you. And if you accept him, God is there, and he is the one at times running down the sideline to cheer you on. But I know what some of you are thinking. You say, but, you know, preacher, can God really be there for me? Now, I want you to think this is really hard, really hard. What is on your refrigerator at home, on the outside of the refrigerator? Do we have magnets? What do we have? Do we have pictures? Uh, pictures, what? Calendars. Calendars. Okay. Pictures. Do we have pictures? Okay, okay. Now, we have pictures of our children sometimes. We have pictures of our grandchildren. Why do you put them on the refrigerator? Because they're yours, right? You want to be reminded. Because they're yours. You're excited for them. Do you know in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 16, it says... In God's word, it says, I have written your name on my hand. In other words, God is saying, hey, if you're my child, I have written your name. I, it's like I put you on the refrigerator. Can you imagine God's refrigerator with all those names on it? He's put it on there. And so I want you to know this morning that God is for you. Now, before some of you doubting Thomases in the room, I want you to know God is for you despite our failures. Despite our failures. Every one of us in this room has made mistakes. We have failed in some way. We have sinned. The Bible tells us that. But I want you to know that God is for us despite the sin. You know, now, I read Romans 8, but in Romans 7, we read last week, Oh, in Romans 7, chapter, four, I mean, chapter 7, verse 14, Paul said, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold as a slave to sin. For I do not understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. What Paul was saying here, what Paul was saying, he said, I was that guy that, were, that was killing Christians. I was there when Stephen was killed. But God used me. You see, our God loves us and God is willing to forgive us. And he's willing to forgive us to the point that he sent his only begotten son. To, 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 can't get my words out. Despise, despite our failures, God 
came to the rescue. Now, some of you have heard the name, Keith, I know you have, Warren Buffett. <laughs> Warren Buffett. Anybody here, any familiar with that name? Okay. Businessman. Some would say rich. Do you know, and I didn't know this, Keith, maybe you did, Warren Buffett had made a Monopoly set. And you know, on Monopoly, what are some of the places on Monopoly? Broadwalk, Park Place, all right? Warren Buffett had it made with his businesses on it. He had his own Monopoly set. But what he did, I think this was like 2005, years ago, years ago. To raise money for one of his charities, he auctioned off a luncheon one-on-one -on -one, where an individual could, could put in a bid to have lunch with him and basically pick his brain. Now, this was 2005. This winning bid came at $351,100. Someone bid that amount to have lunch with Warren Buffett. Keith, you would, you, that wasn't you, right? No, no okay, okay. And, you know, <laughs> why would someone do that? But a lot of people knew of his reputation. Guys, what about God? Did you read the Old Testament? Look what God has done. You read the New Testament? Look at what God has done. We see that God loves us. God has shown, demonstrated his love over and over and over again. Christ died for our sins so that we could live, and he did it willingly so that we could continue. But I also want you to know that the cross is the proof that God is for us. God did not spare his own son. In other words, God said, look, I'm going to show you this and this, but I, I'm not going to give you my son. God gave us his son so that our sins would be taken away. I think one of the greatest tragedies in life, and there's many, but one of them is when a mother says, my son died in war. Sometimes we hear that phrase, her son died in war. Six words. Six words. But what about those six words? Well, what about when she discovered she was going to be a mom? What about when she felt nausea for the weeks? What about when she went through morning sickness? What about when the nausea passed, but then she felt the child kick inside of her? What about the, the common being woke up in the middle of the night? What about towards the end of the pregnancy, she could hardly sleep, and eventually her labor pains had her screaming in agony? And what about that precious sight when she laid eyes upon that child for the first time? Or what about when she nursed this baby boy? She gave up sleep for this boy. She held this fragile infant in her hand. She changed the diapers. She bounced him through colic and rocked him through the fever. She cheered his first steps and wiped away his tears and the blood from his first scrape. She provided discipline. She read books. She took him to school. She learned as many spelling words as he did. She explained math and history and the mystery of girls. She watched him grow tall and strong, and she provided socks and shoes for every step of the way. She learned the rules of his favorite sport and the favorite meal that he had. She read the newspapers with frightening headlines. She cried when he left for boot camp. She wrote the letters and weekends and that last weekend and her last Thanksgiving together. And yes, she answered the door when the officers came with the news that her baby boy, who grew up to be a soldier, died in a ditch at the hands of an enemy. 
Then the sentence comes. Her son died in the war. It has different meaning now, doesn't it? Well, God did not spare his own son. That should have a different meaning to us, to realize what God did, how God gave us his son. But lastly, forgiveness is the proof that God is for us. Forgiveness that God is for us this morning to think what God has done. There was a man, his name was Moses Bittock. In October 2005, he celebrated the experience he had been waiting for in his life to achieve, and that was to become a U.S. citizen. He was a native of Kenya, and the happiest days of his life was when he became a U.S. citizen. And on his way home, he stopped to get gas, and guess what? He checked... Now, this ain't a Baptist guy. Now, uh, he checked his lotto numbers. And on that day, he won $1.8 million. The same day, he became a U.S. citizen. I guess he was thinking, boy, it only can happen in America. But, you know, he was thinking, man, I'm an American. I'm an American citizen and I won the lotto. But guys, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have been given the citizenship citizenship of the kingdom of God. Think about that. I know some of you in the back of your mind said, Preacher, that 1.8 wouldn't hurt. But think about, are you a citizen in the kingdom of God? God? I mean, don't go through your whole life and not gain the citizenship, say that real fast, of God. You don't want to miss that, do you? You know, all the descriptions that I've heard of heaven, I don't even think come close to what it will actually be. Guys, God has forgiven us through his son, Jesus Christ. He has given us this personal privilege of being a citizen of God. This morning, are you a citizen of God? You can be by accepting Jesus Christ. But you know, there's another story, and I'll end with this. There's, you know, in the story, in in the Bible, we find where a blind man was begging at the temple one day, and you know, he was trying to get a few coins to have something to eat, probably to continue to live. But one day, as Jesus came along the way, the blind man, he didn't know who came, but here came Jesus. And Jesus didn't give him a coin. Jesus didn't give him a talk, you know, if you do this or do that, you know. But Jesus gave him sight. He gave him sight. Guys, in our world today, things are crazy. Things are not fair. Things are off the wall. But I want you to know something. If God is for you, don't worry about the rest. And he is for you. If you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, he is for you. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for your love. Lord, guide us. And Lord, may we see how you are there for us. And Lord, may we accept that in our lives. Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't know you, I pray that they would come and accept you in your son's name. Amen.